I am a researcher at the French CN. I am a researcher at the French CNRS, and I'm the chair of the Standing Committee for Gender Equality in Science. So that's what is behind the acronym SCGES. SCGES is an independent committee formed in 2020 by nine international scientific organizations, most of which are full members of the International Science Council. These founding partners had worked together on the uh, project supported by ISC called, the project was called A Global Approach to the Gender Gap in Mathematical Computing and Natural Sciences, how to measure it, how to reduce it. This project became known as the Gender Gap in Science Project. Today, SCGS has 24 partners, most of which are ISC International Union members. They represent millions of scientists brought together across disciplines to promote gender equality in science. The aim of SCGS is to ensure liaison amongst these international scientific unions to foster gender equality and the implementation of the recommendations of the Gender Gap in Science project, especially in the scientific communities that the unions represent. SCGS actively cooperates with policymakers and international organizations, first and foremost ISC, for the promotion of gender equality in science. So we are a global organization. Some of the disciplines represented uh, in SCGS have much to contribute to our understanding of the gender gap in science, and geography is one such discipline. Therefore, I very much look forward to today's webinar which is organized by the International Geographical Union, one of the SCGS partners. We will now hear five women geographers who are based on three different continents, discuss various aspects of the past, present and future of women's work as geographers, as well as the ways in which geography relates to gender. But before to start, uh, allow me to give you um, uh, a little, uh, a few details on who who is here today. If I could have the second slide, please, uh, which will show you uh, the, um, uh, yes, a map of where we are, all of us. Uh, so as you can see, uh, I would say somewhat unusually for SCGS webinars, the largest audience is in Asia. Uh, we also have people in Europe, the States and uh, uh, North and South America, in Africa too. Um, so we are well, um, you know, well uh, all around the world. Um, as for gender, uh, as you can see, a vast majority of our audience today is female. Um, this has not is not the case to such an extent with. Um, other webinars before, but I, I should underline the fact that SCGES uh, also has men in it, and so men are more than welcome to uh, take part in our efforts and to join them. Um, the next slide will show us uh, the division amongst disciplines. So, not surprisingly, we have a large number of geographers with us today. Um, and then mathematicians are also quite, uh, um, uh, it looks to me like they're almost 25%. And then you can see that uh, the other disciplines are uh, represented to, some other disciplines are represented um, to some extent. And if I can have the next slide, uh, you can see that, um, we have we we have asked you when you have registered what what, what stage of your career are. So we have uh, people from all ages and also importantly secondary school teachers. Uh, so it does confirm that the interest of for gender equality of in science um, is uh, there at all states of career. Uh, and everywhere in education, which I think is good news. And uh, now I will give the floor to our speakers uh, for um, their presentations. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Catherine. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you from wherever you're joining us. I am Neetika Yadav, an emerging feminist geographer and PhD scholar at the Department of Geography, Delhi School of Economics, University of Delhi in India. And I will be moderating the first half of today's webinar. The webinar will be recorded and uploaded on the SCGES YouTube page. Before we begin with today's presentations, I request all attendees to kindly keep their camera off and microphone muted. Also, please use the chat box for any questions you may have. We will curate the questions for our speakers to address at the end of all the presentations. Our first speaker of today's webinar is Professor Yush, retired former associate professor at the Department of Geography, Planning and International Development Studies at the University of Amsterdam. She has formerly served as the first vice president of the International Geographical Union, she will be delivering her talk on History Unveiled, Mapping Women's Participation in IGU. Professor Yush, I request you to address us. Thank you so much, Catherine and Tika, for introducing this seminar and introducing me. I'm very pleased to be the first speaker in this webinar and would like to thank the SCEGS for organizing this meeting on women in geography. Uh, and thanks, Maria, for uh, dealing with my slides. Um, so the first slide is already uh, on the screen. Um, to start with the second slide. Maria, could you? Show me this second slide. Yes. I bear evil tidings. By every objective measure that can be mastered, the lot of the female geographer is and has been a discouraging one. And there's little assurance of substantial improvement during this foreseeable future. In purely numerical terms, ours is a lopsidedly male profession in which women are most conspicuous by their absence or rarity. Furthermore, the evidence indicates that just as in any other scientific discipline, any young woman contemplating a professional career in geography can look forward to substantially less in both the short and long run in terms of material and non-material rewards, such as attainment of higher degrees, rank, appointment to prestigious institutions, salary, power, honors, office and national organizations, or the opportunity for a creative scholarship than is the case for a young man of the same age and native ability. Only the female geographer endowed with exceptional intellect and character has been able to realize anything close to full potential. These, of course, are not my words. It is an exclamation from 1973 of former president of the American Association of Geographers Dilber Zelensky in his presidential address and his article, The Strange Case of the Missing Female Geographer. Zelensky's article is the first one in a long row of publications about the underrepresentation of women in geography. All these articles, published long ago or more recently, express the same discouraging message that although the situation has improved, women are still underrepresented in the discipline of geography, in particular in secure positions and higher ranks, and not only in the United States, but in almost all countries of the world. In line with Zelensky, these articles demonstrate usually the evil tiding. Janice Monk, who was one of the founders of the International Geographical Union Commission on gender and geography, and passed away a few months ago, 
is one of the very few feminist geographers who is not focusing on the missing female geographer, but on the present ge female geographer. Women geographers who often under difficult conditions succeeded in making a career in geography and contributing to the development of geographical knowledge. She reported the opportunities for women geographers in early 20th century, at a time that university positions were almost inaccessible for women. Several women geographers, mainly from middle class families, were employed as librarians and editors and made important contributions to the field of geography. And she demonstrated that the first decades of the 20th century were a period in which feminist efforts and the social and economic contexts opened new educational opportunities for women, while the 1920s and 1930s was a period in which opportunities for women geographers declined. And furthermore, she demonstrated that careers of women academic geographers were very different from that of men at that time. Many women started their careers at normal schools and as teachers before a university education and a doctorate in geography and an academic career. In this presentation, I will focus on the underrepresentation and the presence of women in the International Geographical Union during the more than 100 years of its existence. An international community of geographers existed already before the foundation of the IGU in 1922. The first International Geographical Congress was organized in Antwerp in 1871. This Congress was a meeting of about 600 geographers, but also cartographers, explorers, military, traders, and academic scientists. And as Mechtet Rössler reports, almost no women participated in the early congresses. Women in sciences existed in two forms, outside the scientific institutions and universities, or as wives or daughters or secretaries, accompanying male scientists participating in the so-called ladies program of the Congress, as it was called at the time. One of the first women scientists was Elena Gonzalez Acha de Correa Morales from Argentina, who participated in the International Geographical Congress in 1891 in Bern, Switzerland. She was really a remarkable woman, and her career was in line with the careers of American uh, women geographers in this period as reported by Jens Monk. Elena Gonzalez Archa de Correa Morales went to normal school and she became a teacher and a painter. And she was one of the first women who completed normal school in Argentina. She started with publishing books, textbooks and other books on geography. She promoted education for women and she gave advice to indigenous people who were defending land claims. And 19th century, we have to think about it. She took the initiative for the foundation of the Argentinian Geographical Society and was its first president. A few women participated in the Congress in Washington in 1904, and the list of participants of the 1913 Congress in Rome includes hundreds of male geographers and six women. After the First World War, representatives of the American of the, Ac the Academies of Sciences of the Allied Powers took the initiative for an International Research Council and the creation of disciplinary international unions, one of them being the International Geographical Union. At the time of its origin, IGU was mainly a European project. The founding countries were Belgium, France, Italy. 
Portugal, Spain, and the United Kingdom, and Japan. Membership was growing gradually, and RGU become, became more and more international, with currently more than 100 members representing all country, continents in the world. An analysis of the position of women in the IGU is complicated because of the specific membership structure of IGU. Formal members of the IGU are not people, but national IGU committees representing the academic geographers in a country. The more than 40 thematic commissions have about 12,000 members, and the majority of the commissions publish the number of members per country, the data on the gender of the commission members are not available. So the analysis in this presentation is therefore based on the list of presidents, secretaries general and vice presidents in the past 102 years, and a list of steering committee members of the commissions between 2004 and 2022. During the first decades of existence, RGU was not exclusively a community of academic geographers, but a mixture of military, civil service, and academic geographers, all men, of course, there was no place for women in this uh, community. Four of the first five RGU presidents were high-ranked military men. General Roland Prince Bonaparte uh, from France, General Nicola Vacelli from Italy, General Robert Bourgeois, also from France, and Commander Charles Close from the United Kingdom. It's only from 1938 onwards that all presidents were academic geographers. In the 100, uh, 102 years of its existence, RGU had 26 presidents only one of them, a woman, the Irish Annette Bettemer, who was president from 2000 to 2004. And the second woman president, Nathalie Le Marchand, who will speak uh, after me. She's from France. She's just elected a month ago during the International Geographical Congress in Dublin in August. And of course, we are very pleased by this. And Bettemer was famous as a humanistic geographer and she had an exceptional career. After graduation from University College in Cork, she became a nun in Seattle, where she completed a PhD in geography. Her cosmopolitan career took her to Belgium, France, Canada, United Kingdom, and Sweden, before she became full professor in Dublin. The first woman in the IGU Executive Committee was elected in 1938, the Belgian Marguerite Lefebvre, who became IGU Secretary General jointly with Paul Michot, Professor in Geography at the Catholic University of Louvain. Michot passed away in 1940, and Lefebvre remained IGU Secretary General until 1949, and her career was unlike careers of male academic geographers, but as Janice Monk demonstrated, in line with the careers of many American women geographers in the first half of the 20th century. She was educated at normal school, became a teacher before she was appointed as the secretary of Paul Michot, who was at that time director of the Institute of Geography in Louvain. And after some years, she took courses in geography in Louvain and Liège, and finally went to Paris, where she completed a PhD in geography. And she returned to Louvain and became director of the Institute of Geography after the death of Paul Michot. And although she was an internationally recognized researcher, a committed teacher and manager of the Institute, it was not before 1960 that she was promoted to full professor, the first woman who became full professor at the Catholic University of Louvain. No women were represented in the executive committee of the IGU, 
between 1952 and 1984, when Maria Gutierrez de McGregor from Mexico was elected as vice president. And with the exception of Marguerite Lefebvre and Anne Wetterberg, the first women vice presidents were from outside Europe, the Nigerian Falasade Iyun, the Brazilian Bertha Becker, the Mexican Irazema Alcantara Ayala, and the Australian Ruth Fincher. From 2012 onwards, more European women were elected as vice presidents. And since 2020, the EC has four women members and has currently a woman president and three women vice presidents. Looking at the steering committee members of the RGU commissions, we see that the share of women has increased from 25 to 35% in the past 20 years. The representation of women geographers is different in the different parts of the world. The share of women from European and Latin American countries in the current steering committees is higher than from Asia, North America, Africa, and Oceania. And human geography commissions have in general higher numbers of women steering committee members and more often a woman as chair or co-chair than the physical geography commissions. In conclusion, geography was and still is a male dominated discipline worldwide. And this male domination is ref reflected in the International Geographical Union. The representation of women geographers, however, has improved substantially in the 102 years of its existence and in the past decades in particular. Nowadays, many women from all parts of the world are active in IGU and the share of women has increased substantially. However, as Jens Monk has convincingly demonstrated, it's still important to give face and voice to the increasing numbers of women geographers in all parts of the world. Thank you, Nitika. Thank you, Professor Yosh, for your insightful perspective on tracing the history of women in the IGU. I now invite Professor Natalie, Professor at University of Paris and President of the International Geographical Union to deliver her presentation, Women, Leadership and Gender Sensitive Innovations at the IGU. Professor Nathalie, I request you to address us. Thank you, Nitika. Uh, no, it's not that. <laughs> Sorry. Um... I prepare my PowerPoint. Thank you very much. It is an honor to be invited to this webinar. All my gratitude to the organizer and especially Anintida for putting together this session. It is important for geography and geographers and thus for IGU to be an active partner in, an, in, in the Standing Committee for Gender Equality in Science. It is important for the well-being of sciences and of geography that we, male and female geographers, can look at where we were, discuss where we are now, and point out to what can be done to ensure that gender equality in geography is not just a goal, but a reality. I was asked uh, to speak about leadership 
and gender sensitive innovation at IGU. I must say that reading this title again and again, I wonder what I could possibly say, what I can say, where should I start? Well, I guess I can say that in IGU, one of the most recent gender sensitive innovations that was implemented was to elect a woman as president, wasn't it? As you know, however, I'm not the first woman president. As yours told, Anne Butimer was in 2000, some 80 years after IGU Foundation. Things are improving. Aren't they? It took 80 years for the first woman to be president, 24 years for the second. Let's make sure that time span continues to shorten and that having a woman or a man as president is just in the order of things. That is why we are here today, looking at this horizon and what can be done to get there. I can just, uh, uh, just like, sorry. This being said, I realized that speaking to you today as president of IGU does not say much about gender equality in geography. So I got nervous and wonder what else can I say? Why I'm not a specialist of gender in general or of gender equality in science, neither am I a specialist of the feminist movement or a feminism in geography. I am grateful to all of you who are specialists. <laughs> you are the ones helping geography and geographers to help achieve gender equality in our department, in our university, and in the practice of science. Coming to my sense, it say to myself, well, you are not a specialist, but you happen to be a woman and a feminist and what I call an ordinary or day-to-day -day feminist. In my family, I have three sisters, in my university, in my teaching where it applies, in my involvement in scientific organization in France and of course in IGU. How I can describe what is an ordinary feminism. I think it's based on the observation of and the understanding of, but it's usual in geography, the structural inequality between men and women in everyday situations and places. I say that as a person who comes from a, let me say, working class family living in a collective apartment complex who went to university and discovered that there exist social classes, cultural privileges, and gender inequality. I did not grasp all that I was saying, but for sure I did not, I did not like it. That's how I became an ordinary militant feminist. Well, as I speak to you today, it looks pretty good. But back then, I was simply fighting for a better life, encouraging young female students and colleagues to project themselves into the positions that they serve to ensure that they are not unfair obstacles in the way. All those years with Fellow travelers, we've been through ups and downs, joy and here and there tears, sometimes anger. What, I've, what have I learned now that I am IGU president? First, I learned that to move forward, you need trailblazers. Above all women who open or maintain the path and give you up. I know some of you were, some of you are, so I've decided to assume that I might be one of them now. Two, 
I learned that gender equality in science is not against men, even if a fair number of our colleagues might find that way. Third, I learned that gender equality in science is never a woman thing. It is for the benefit of science, because only a diversity of views and talents can ensure that science continues to provide information to improve human beings' life on this earth and this universe, and above all, nowadays, understanding better each other. Finally, as geographers, one last thing we know too well, that situations and challenges vary according to where you, we are at different scales, facing different challenges according to the local, regional and national context. Thanks to the organizer, we can see it in today's program. In this perspective, and without surprise, my presentation is based on my experience as a specialist of the geography of commerce and consumption, and firstly, my experience as a woman geographer in a European and French national context, and to conclude a word on leadership. In relating to, the, in relating to them, I will insist three points. I'm beginning with this figure, which highlights the inequality in academic career between women and men. While there are significantly more women at bachelor's and master's level, and their graduation rate is higher. There are slightly fewer women who finish their PhD, and then the gap widens as the career progresses. One consequence of this imbalance was, is, that academic committees or councils, or even the dean of the department, for example, were all men, with a few exceptions. For some years now, there have been rules aimed at increasing the number of women at a high career level and achieving a better balance between men and women at all levels of position in the academic world. But the increase in the number of women at a high career level is very slow and has consequences for the capacity of high-level women to agree to participate in each council or committee on which they are asked to serve. Let me take the French example. In 2020, 30% of academic teachers and researchers in French universities are women, but only 28% are full professors. This is the same average in geography. One of the objectives of the gender innovation policy at university, at French universities, is to increase the number of women full professors. One of the gender sensitive initiatives was by law by law to force all committees from recruitment to administrative function to be gender balanced. The consequence is that since there are not many women full professor, they are more involved in recruitment and new diversity affairs. The same can be said to younger female associate or assistant professor. We are more involved in university and other academic institutions. The consequence of that gender sensitive initiative thus leads to gender imbalance in scientific activities and programs. The follow up consequence is that the women tend to be promoted more frequently at local level in universities than at national level. It is a fact in my case, for example, I was always promoted by my university at the local level. Even I was elected at all national bodies as, for example, a member of National University Council for Geography. I think that 
this situation is a result of a system that would facilitate men and of a research team that is, in my case, often overlooked in geography, for example, in my case, the geography of retailing. I take the view that one of the best gender innovation is to have women in position of leadership or role model. Throughout my career, I have had the good fortune to meet some of them, both in the French National Committee of Geography and in its commission on the geography of retailing, as well as at university. I start I started working on the geography of retailing during my PhD, and I'm still passionate about it today. Retailing is a real mirror of our societies. As early as my doctorate, I took part in the work of the Commission of Retailing, Geography of Retailing, sorry, where I met a founder, Jacqueline Baudrillard, one of the leading figures in French geography. She had an influence beyond France. She was active within the IGU and participated in number commissions. In the Ge Commission of Geography of Retail, group of uh, working of activity, uh, geography, sorry, um, the group of uh, geography of commercial activities, for example. In the Commission of Geography of Retailing, in the French National Committee, I also met the Belgian geographer Bernadette Meren Schumacher, whose work also enjoys, whose work also enjoys an international reputation. She has also set up a number of IGU meetings of the Geography of Commercial Activities working groups. All those women women were leaders, as Bernadette Meren Schumacher still is. She is still in the Commission of uh, Retailing. And mentors in making this commission a place where a young female geographer could feel encouraged in her ambitions. My involvement in the commission led me to become its president before being elected vice president of the National Committee. Once again, this was an opportunity to meet another leading female geographer, Yvette Verre, who was the first female French geographer to be president of the National Committee. She is a geomorphologist, and it comes to me an, another point that in some areas of geography research, it is more difficult than in others for a woman to work as a career. Physical geography is one of them, and by the fact that it dominated the discipline as a war for many decades, it also gave rise to the discipline initially being a male one. But luckily, in this domain of researches, things changed too. Then, in 2023, the first prize for a PhD in geography, awarded by the French National Committee of Geography, one to a young woman whose PhD was on Holocene glacial fluctuation in Greenland. And an award was presented to a young male geographer for an issue on sexual and gender minorities in exile. As you understand now at the end of my presentation, being elected president of IGU is a result of a pathway where I was accompanied with colleagues, female colleagues, but also benevolent male colleagues who would facilitate women's participation in the discipline and in higher positions. This openness also means openness to the richness and diversity of the discipline. That is why from now on, IGU policy will be to encourage parity not only in the standing committees of commissions, but also at congresses, on committees and among speakers. 
with the support of the ATGIS, we launched a survey this year on the position of women in the commissions and national committees. And we will go away to assist progress through further surveys. But to finish, I would like just to add some words. As it, of, as it is often the case when I have to do a presentation, I wonder why they ask me and if I can really do that. If I am the right person, well, you know, it as much as I do, the famous imposter syndrome. Yours, drug lover fortune, past first president of ITU, told me recently in Dublin, before I was elected, that the best way to seal with it is just to recognize that it is there, that it will not go away. And the best way to deal with it is just to admit it and move on. Thank you, Yos. Leadership is having women involved by their action and by inspiring. And I hope I can inspire as much as I have been inspired by women and in my university, in my speciality, and in IG. Thank you. Merci. Thank you, Professor Natalie. We are grateful for your engaging insights on a regional layout on the leadership of women at IGU alongside the gender-sensitive innovations. I now invite Professor Mari, lecturer in regional geographic analysis at the Department of Geography, Autonomous University of Barcelona. She is also a steering committee member of the IGU Commission on Gender and Geography. She will be speaking to us on Gender and Geography, Insights from Spanish Perspectives. Professor Maria, I request you to address us. Thank you very much for your presentation. I'm going now to share my screen, just a moment. Can you tell me, please, is it okay for you? Can you see my presentation? Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you very much. So I would like to start thanking the organizers for inviting me to this uh, panel. And uh, also I'm happy to, to share this, this time with, with my colleagues, uh, other geography colleagues from all around the world. Uh, First, I would like to just to show a, a simple a slide to, to let you know the, the structure of my presentation. I will go through these different points and I hope uh, to be well understood because uh, my pronunciation maybe is not uh, good enough. Uh, in Spain, gender perspectives were first, first introduced uh, into geography in the early uh, 1980s, led by pioneering female human geographers, uh, especially Professor Maria Dolores Garcia Ramon. These scholars were inspired by international feminist geography networks, seminars, and conferences, and they actively participated as organizers in various events. One of the early examples was the publication of several special issues on gender and geography by the Catalan journal Documents d'Anàlisi Geogràfica. The first one appeared in 1989 and followed by several ones. Also, contributions from other journals like Boletín de la Asociación de Geógrafos Españoles. The Geography and Gender Research Group at Universitat Autónoma de Barcelona has played a central role in integrating gender perspectives into geography, both in teaching and research since its creation in 1987. On a global scale, it has been very important the role of the International Geographical Union's Commission on Gender and Geography, established also at the end of 1980s and uh, with Maria Dolores Garcia Ramon as its secretary alongside prominent scholars 
so just Janet Momsen and our dear Janice Monk. Despite these advances, the introduction of gender perspectives in Spanish geography departments was met with resistance in many regions. However, apart from the Universitat Autónoma de Barcelona group, a second major research group emerged at the Complutense University of Madrid with Professor Ana Sabaté. The gender focus has been mainly centered on the analysis of rural spaces and urban studies and has been often based on empirical research. Over the past 25 years, other topics have been studied, such as female travelers, migration, environment, body and sexuality, as well as gender and women in academic Spanish geography. Female geographers from various universities and regions have shown interest in gender and feminist research, but it has been challenging to consolidate projects, especially for those without permanent positions or funding. Spanish geography departments have prioritized geographical information systems or urban planning, often marginalizing gender approaches within the field of social and human geography. Concerning teaching, there have been some advances. On the one hand, optional courses on gender and geography have been introduced in geography degrees and graduate programs. And on the other hand, geography has been recognized as a relevant subject in master's and doctoral studies on gender. This has been facilitated networking with professionals from other social sciences providing mutual support in a context of continued difficulties and resistances. Networks and relationships has also, have also been developed with the Latin, Latin American context through research stays, teaching exchanges, research collaboration, and particularly through PhD students from Latin American countries who came to Spain to develop their thesis on gender and geography. In recent years, a new generation of geographers has emerged, working on feminist geography, though the effects of financial crisis with reduced budgets for research and a lack of job opportunities have hindered the promotion of feminist geography. The unequal territorial distribution observed in the 1980s persists, making it difficult to develop teaching or research focused on gender or even incorporating a gender perspective. As a result, I would like to stress that networking and collaboration with feminist geographers from other international contexts or with feminist researchers from other disciplines remains a key strategy. In uh, 2014, Maria Dolores Garcia Ramon and Ana Ortiz, colleagues from Universitat Autónoma de Barcelona, offered an overview of gender and geography in Spain in a book edited by Mexican colleagues Maria Veronica Ibarra and Irma Escamilla. Based mainly on the analysis of articles from Spanish journals and selection of books, they reviewed the production during the period 2005 to 2014. They grouped the publications into eight thematic areas, theory and methodology, urban spaces, rural spaces, work and migration, body and sexuality, academia, environment, and demography. From their analysis, the urban spaces and theory and methodology stood out, especially those focus on the use and appropriation of public spaces, as well as issues of fear and security in the city. Regarding theoretical and methodological issues, the articles that analyze the state of gender geography in different countries and regions, along with conceptual and methodological articles, were also among the most relevant topics. In their final reflection, Garcia Ramon and Ortiz highlighted as novelties the contributions to the geographies of childhood and youth, as well as those related to studies of the body and the geography of sexualities. Finally, they expressed regret over the lack of a unified and original theoretical framework in a context in where empirical studies have until now dominated the field. 
Another key indicator of the progress made in gender studies within Spanish geography over the last 30 years is the significant increase in the number of doctoral theses defended. According to data collected and selected by Bailina and Ortiz, in the period from 1990 to 2021, 63 doctoral theses in geography and gender have been defended in Spain, distributed across, across 12 universities and 24 different doctoral programs. The vast majority, uh, 59 of those, have been defended by women. Likewise, the vast majority, or uh, a bit more than uh, half of it, have defended themselves at Universitat Autónoma de Barcelona. Regarding the geographical area of study, Spain is where the greatest number of theses have been focused, followed by other European or Latin American countries, countries often, often related to the place of origin of the doctoral students. Over 20 years ago, the issue of masculinization of Spanish geography and the marginalization of gender perspectives in teaching and research was first highlighted by García Ramón and Herminia Pujol. Two decades later, this trend has not only persisted, but has intensified. Factors contributing to this ongoing masculinization include the shift in study plans toward greater technical specialization, the limited availability of courses focused on geography and gender in curricula, and the general lack of gender perspective in university geography programs and teaching among other challenges. In the mid-80s, the percentage of women among geography students in Spain was 56%. By the end of the century, this percentage had decreased to 40%, still within a range that we can consider gender parity. However, this figure was already notably low compared to related fields in social sciences or, or humanities. Only in engineering and architecture, was the figure lower at 26%. This decline reflects a broader trend of the masculinization of both faculty and students, which has progressed in parallel over the time. <clears throat> in uh, 2024, the Spanish Association of Geography, AGE, published a report on its website about the participation of women in Spanish geography. Regarding students, the report indicates that the average percentage of female geography students in public universities in Spain is below 37%. In some regions, the percentage of women among students is even below 25%. As observed in the data from two decades ago, such masculinization of geography students aligns closely with the data characterizing STEM studies rather than other social sciences or humanities where women can represent up to 70% of the student body. Recent data reveals a concerning trend. Instead of witnessing a positive change, the gender imbalance in geography programs has either stagnated or worsened, signaling a continued consolidation of the masculinization of Spanish geography. A predominance of male students is likely to lead to a majority of male faculty, perpetuating a cycle that will be difficult to break without implementing proactive measures to reverse this trend. We will now refer to the teaching staff or faculty in the departments of the Spanish University where geography studies are offered. According to the data presented by the Association of Spanish Geographers, in the vast majority of geography departments, the percentage of women is below 35%. And in some regions, the percentage of female faculty is even below 30. The Spanish, the same Spanish Association of Geography has recently published another report analyzing the status of geography programs based on feedback from 15 departments. Notably, only one department identified the low enrollment of female students as a weakness, despite of a total of 14 weaknesses being identified. This suggests a widespread lack of recognition of the gender disparity issue, 
or at least a lack of awareness that it could be considered a problem worth addressing. In response to the observed masculinization in geography students, which mirrors the masculinization of faculty in Spanish universities, we were interested in understanding the opinions of geography departments in Spain where geography degrees are offered. Specifically, we had the goal to determine whether any measures, activities or programs have been designed to implement to counter this trend. To gather this information, we, Maria Dolores Garcia Ramon and myself, contacted the Spanish geography departments by email and asked them four simple questions, you can see on the screen, that could be answered easily in a reply. <clears throat> we reached out to 30 departments, geography departments, and have received an answer from 12. It's a 40% response rate so far. Their responses received confirmed the masculinization indicated by aggregated data. Only one department reported a situation of gender parity, while all other responders confirmed masculinization among both students and faculty. There is evident concern about the issue, which is generally regarded as a real relevant problem. The fact that the majority of answers and expressions of interest come from women staff is another important factor, we think, to take in account. When asked about the reasons for this masculinization, the responses are unclear and often reflect confusion or misinformation. There is a lack of understanding regarding the reasons behind this situation, along with an inability to find an explanation for this trend that persisted over time. Nevertheless, some ideas are shared about the degree title itself, which can be not appealing to women, the fact that female students have broader choices due to their higher average entrance grade for university studies, or the increasing importance of information technologies and GIS. The lack of female models or the masculinization of students that leads to staff masculinization. Regarding the final question on measures taken to address this issue, responses vary. In some cases, no actions have been implemented. In others, the following initiatives have been taken. Different kind of exhibitions highlighting women geographers, talks and seminars addressing the situation, increased representation of women in promotion, um, uh, introducing the perspective, gender perspective in teaching, or uh, working to have more female representation in key committees, organizing activities in secondary education, or also taking measures that, that are uh, commonly present in equality university plans. This brief overview highlights the positive advancements in integrating a gender perspective within Spanish geography over the past three decades. In just one generation, we have witnessed a remarkable transformation from a lack of awareness regarding gender issues in Spanish geography to the inclusion of specific courses in some curricula, the establishment of research projects and specialized group, and the successful defense of over 60 doctoral theses in this field, all of which serve as concrete indicators of progress. Despite these achievements, one of the most pressing challenges remains the masculinization of Spanish geography. It is evident and even more pronounced that it was 20 years ago. Reversing this trend appears challenging without the implementation of a strong, sustained, positive actions over an extended period. This is not just an academic concern. I think it is a political issue that requires genuine, genuine political will to address. While this phenomenon is not unique to Spain, in our case, recent changes in degree titles and increasing technification of curricula have intensified the trend. It is clear that there is still much work to be done. 
a certain lack of awareness about the issue is evident, and even the masculinization is recognized, then is often not viewed as a problem or something that needs to be addressed. Due to the general lack of priority or even recognition, there is a minimal activity around this problem. No action has been taken or <coughs> the need and good intentions to consider it have yet not to be put into practice. When measures have been implemented, there is still no evidence of their impact. Other potential measure, measures or actions have been suggested elsewhere and include re reforms of study plans, um, other images and languages uh, in the promotion or uh, <coughs> establishment of gender balanced leadership teams in geography departments. Every of these suggestions and others that you can add maybe during the, the debate uh, are necessary to dismantle privileges and to address power imbalances traditionally characterized by heteropatriarchy. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Maria, for your thought-provoking comments on uh, the Spanish perspectives, you know, for the beginnings and the evolution on, of gender and geography. Now I would like to move forward with our next speaker, Professor Yossili lecturer at State University of Ponta Grossa and the present chair of the IGU Commission on Gender and Geography. She will deliver a talk on Feminist Geography in Latin America, Epistemological Challenges and the Decoloniality of Knowledge. We look forward to listening to you, Professor Yosely. Thank you, Nitika. Thank you to the organizers for the prepare, prepare, uh, for the preparing this important meeting. Um, let me share my screen. In this talk, I will explore the growth of gender studies in Latin America, even facing resistance in the scientific field and the advance of conservative policies in the continent. I also address the challenges faced by the feminist research in colonized space. Um, it seems impossible to accommodate the plurality of the Latin American feminist movements in, sing in a single narrative of development. Uh, there is a diversity of related elements that make the specificities of temporal spaces for each country in this huge and diverse continent. However, I consider that the political fight against a military dictatorship in a com is a common element of different countries in our region and that the involvement of women in this experience is an important ingredient of Latin American feminist movement. The female experience during the dictatorship periods exposed the male privilege, even inside the leftist parties, uh, and the need to create a specific organization that could address gender and the power relations. The female organization was relevant in the democratization process of Latin American countries mainly in the late 70s and the 80s, bringing to the public arena the claim of sexual, civil, political, economic, and legal rights. And um, despite the long history and the plural, uh, plurality uh, of the feminist movements, the visibility of female demonstrations and claims has been promoted by the 
popularization of the access to the internet and social media. Crowds have used the public space as never before, gathering new women from different social class, religion, race, sexual orientation, marital status, and so on. And uh, in these recent feminist episodes, there is a new generation of women, but also young men that adopted the gender agenda and uh, have been reflecting upon the construction of male privileged structures. Uh, the structures. The so-called feminist waves in Latin America that have been occupying the public space since in 2016, such as the walk against, against feminicide, ni una menos, or not one less, and the campaign to make abortion legal, niñas no madres or uh, girls not mothers in Argentina, the demonstration against the sexual harassment in Chilean universities that stopped 35 education institutions in that country and the Brazilian woman walk against the extremely right candidate Jair Bolsonaro in 2017 with the slogan, Ele não, not him. And then see the break of silence of women's, of women's claim. The public space that were taken by the female bodies and at the same time the use of female bodies as spaces of fight have created our urban landscapes with which the Latin American geographical science has had to negotiate mainly uh, with younger uh, generations. The traditional despise for the production of feminist geographies for over 40 years and the silence around gender privileges in space approaches by the Latin American geography hegemonic currents became impossible to be kept do the explicit and material women's geographicity in the last few years. The scientific field of geography in Latin America was gradually permeated by gender and sexuality research, evidencing a sharp growth in countries like Brazil, Argentina, and Mexico, as well as the appearance of younger researchers in Ecuador, Colombia, and Chile. Brazil is the most expressive Latin American country concerning number of gender and sexuality studies due to the size of the population of the number of post-graduation programs in the country. The growth of this field in Brazil was greatly influenced by the affirmative policies created during the government of the Workers' Party. The contestation of the geography oneness by researchers uh, that started to call themselves feminists made it possible possible a uh, specific um, epistemological and methodological way and developed effective actions around this identity, such as creation of the Latin American Geography and Gender Journal in 2009. Another example is the creation of regular meetings called the Latin American Seminar on Geography, Gender, and sexualities with its, the first chapter was in uh, 2011 in Rio de Janeiro, the second in 2014 in Porto Velho, Brazil, the third was in uh, 2017 in Mexico City, in 2019 in Tandil, Argentina, and 2022 in Santiago del Chile, in 2014 in Bogota, 
Colombia. And the, the next one uh, will be in Costa Rica. The expansion of feminist geographies in Latin America occurred uh, with the more evidence after 2000. Even so, the feminist scientific production in the Latin American geography is still developed in a marginal way when the geopolitical of uh, scientific prestigious network of universities and the scientific publication means in Brazil, Argentina, and Mexico are observed. Despite their analytical power, feminist geographies are still made invisible in the Latin American geography discipline field. Um, aggregating gender, masculinity, or femininity in certain determined analysis does not make a certain result to be considered feminist. A feminist geography does not have this status a priori, but it is continued uh, consti constituted as feminist in the scientific doing process, which must be commun uh, committed to the transformation of the social order and the promotion of gender, gender fa fairness. The feminist scientific practices uh, from the reflection upon four principles which are independent and must be constantly considered, namely the power of the epistemological tradition and the field that shapes our way of seeing the world, the, border, the borders and the limits set to the specific community regarding what belongs to the geography or not, the power involving uh, scientific practices, relations, and the location of the researcher in the multiple dimensions in, of interactions develop, developed in the um, investigation process. The scientific doing able to build up visibilities of subjects produced as invisible in, in geography is only possible when we understand that invisibility is not casual, but is rather produced by the power of the tradition of theoretical and the methodological aspects, which limit a certain view of the world. And uh, even the questions that we have able to ask you regarding certain special reality. If you will agree that it is the confront of geographical imagination in different power positions that created the visibility or invisibility of subjects in geography, it is possible to question the rules established by certain geographical communities that legitimate certain geographicities rather than others. Um, considering the principle of power relations at the dimensions of the researcher's position in the feminist research produced in the colonized countries imply a series of uh, reflection practices on the internalization of the empire, look on ourselves and on the research practice. The feminist geography produced in Latin America faces the challenge to contest the Eurocentered basis of the researchers' education and the the colonizing standards that structure the hierarchy of knowledge between human groups. Following feminist principles, considering the positionality of the geographical doing from colonized countries, means to think that the strength of this epistemological tradition that limits the conceptual basis from the masculinity also operates from the concept of whiteness. 
considering the, that the borders and the limits set uh, forth by the scientific field activated to make young women invisible also work to obscure the geographies of non-white people. Power relations and in multiple dimensions evolved in Latin American researchers' uh, position constantly questioned. The coloniality perpetrated and begins and the, their methodological practices and the theoretical choices. The Latin American feminist geography must be committed to the deconstruction of colonizing bases of the discipline and that, in spite of the being Latin American, we also operated the coloniality of knowledge. Thus, feminist geographies that for some time have admitted the need of the intersectional analysis between gender, social class, race, and other oppressions elements still needs to take the role of definitely, the, uh, the, uh, definitely anti-racism. The historical traces of colonial subjugation of native population that mark the special constitution of Latin American countries organi organizes a specific racism thought, a uh, colonizing instrument that, that divides and opposes and the ranks groups that share the same territory and the nation states. If as feminist geographers, we consider that all knowledge is situated. It is not enough to contest the power relations that operate in the constitution of the scientific field by reflections, but, but it's necessary to build up scientific and pedagogical anti-racism practices. This is not a simple process to be developed and it is not a linear path, but rather a perspective to be sought with the awareness of our human limitations as operators of scientific fields. The, the colonization, decolonization of the Latin American feminist resides in the ability to go beyond the binary concept between theory and activism, which is in the center of the relations of power, uh, power in the knowledge production and the appropriation of wealth. Theory and activism are usually consider, considered um, as distinct and hierarchically valid. Theory is seems as pure and neutral knowledge, while activism is construed, construed as knowledge contaminated by sub uh, by subjectivities and emotions. This type of conception of knowledge ranking as a contradiction to the very conception of the feminist thought that criticizes dualities in theory, but reinforces the duality view, which is essentially sustained by the modern and the masculine epistemological view. Another important warning to decolonize the Latin American feminist scientific production is the consideration of the diversity of the Latin American women fights which do not correspond exactly to the feminist models thought of by the academic community. Um, now for final consideration, the feminist geographies have conquered spaces of enunciation because they recognize um, uh, the importance of, of uh, scientific doing that is also political 
and uh, they promote the disputes, both the social and in the dynamics of the geographical organization of the geographic scientific field. Despite the advances obtained so far, one, uh, mo uh, one, one most consider the growth of the extreme right political parts and the fundamentalist religious group that tended to suffocate future perspectives of achieving achievements. However, it is exactly the new liberal and the conservative advance that requires from the Latin American feminist geographies the incorporation of the colonial ideas constituting and knowledge for human freedom and solidarity. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Yosuli, for your talk on tracing feminist geographies from the Latin American perspective. I now invite Professor Anandita. Professor and Head at the Department of Geography, Delhi School of Economics, University of Delhi, and Vice President of the International Geographical Union to deliver her talk on Writing Geographies from the Global South. Professor Anandita, I request you to address us. Professor Anandita, you're on mute. We can't hear you. No. It's still muted. Am I audible now? Yes. Please let me know if you can see my slides in the... Uh... Yes. Are my slides all right? Okay, so thanks to the organizers. And uh, my, my presentation uh, concerns writing and in brackets, so that's implicit feminist and gender geographies from the global south. Uh, I pick up uh, on the themes that uh, my colleagues have been talking about, but my presentation uh, is a little bit different. Um, it is talking not only about women geographers, but also about women in geography in the global south. And in particular, I focus on uh, the Indian context. And this is building on previously published uh, research over the last decade. So right at the onset, let me start off by explaining my positionality. I speak from the disciplinary edge in terms of race, gender, location, institutional context, thematic focus, and the methodological choices that I've made in my uh, career. Uh, I can look at this entire project of mapping women in geography, visibilizing women's lives uh, as subjects and practitioners in geography over three kinds of spaces. Um, here I invoke Lefebvre and uh, we have in my initial uh, focus was on the real space or first space where I was mapping distributions moved on to second space uh, where I'm uh, where I was looking at you know the representations of space and um, uh, now mostly currently my work is focused on the third space which is uh, the lived space 
and I also keep going back to second space as and when um, you know it draws me back. So this, this is just a collage showing the kind of work that uh, has happened uh, you know over the last uh, few decades. Now, if you look at uh, how the subfields developed, why this uh, is important to know is that in India, all feminist, uh, all women are not feminist geographers, but all feminist geographers happen to be women. So this is that subset that I am focusing on. And it is important to parallelly look at how the subfield developed through the efforts of these women geographers. So this is just to give you a context from the 70s onwards. So on the global scale, we had the UN Decade for Women from 1975 to 1985. And at this time, the invisibility of women as subjects and practitioners of geography was first raised by Monk and Hansen um, in their seminal paper on not excluding half of human in human geography. As a result of this and other papers that followed, mapping women's lives or writing a geography of women became prominent in uh, the Anglosphere or the you know, Europe, US, UK. And gradually, the focus shifted from gender roles to gender relations to uh, uh, finally a debate on methods, which was published in Professional Geographer on Should Women Count? Subsequently, ontological turns expanded the scope of feminist geographies and feminist geographies today stands as a, a more equal, more inclusive alternative to uh, mainstream human geography. Now, the four stages that uh, sort of uh, we went through was first stage was where we were writing the geography of women. So we hear the focus was on mapping uh, gender roles in different spatial contexts, looking at different patterns of inequality, the constraints that women encountered in their day to day lives, etc. The next phase was a socialist feminist geography, where we looked at gender relations and role of capitalism and patriarchy in shaping this inequality. Uh, and uh, there was a phase of feminist uh, transversal geographies. And let me just also clarify that, you know, th these were not strict, strictly divided, but there were overlaps. So in you know, when looking at transversal geographies, then mobility, migration, citizenship, violence, all these were key themes and eventually geographies of difference where we recognize diversity, difference, identity and aspects of uh, location. So this has broadly been um, the you know, trajectory of development of the subfield worldwide. And in India, you do see that it is we, we still seem to be um, sort of fixed on the first two uh, stages and probably just entering the third stage. There are a few studies here entering the third stage. And of course, there are some outliers where um, people are talking about identity, difference um, and diversity. Now, uh, the in India, these women geographers made a very quiet beginning. The Contexts uh, were that the Towards Equality report, which looked at the status of women, this was an extensive uh, report which was um, commissioned and presented in Parliament 1974 and 1975. So it was against this uh, report that these beginnings were made. Feminist activism was at an all time high. You know, this was. Uh, protesting against custodial violence through the Mathura, you know, in, that was evidenced in the Mathura rape case, Maya uh, Tyagi and the Ramiza B rape cases, which were very high, uh, high profile rape cases that happened um, in this period. And it is also at this time that the first feminist journal called Manushi began to be published. The persona of our uh, woman prime minister, first woman prime minister, Mrs. Indira Gandhi, was towering. She has been referred to as the only man in her cabinet. Mainstream cinema also projected very strong women characters. So it was as if these roles were, you know, author-backed roles were written for these uh, very charismatic actresses in art house as well as mainstream cinema, Smita Patil, Rekha, Shavana Azmi and the like. It was against this that the early papers on female migration, literacy, work participation uh, began to appear. But there was no debate on women's invisibility within geography as we had seen in the West. 
just these quite sporadic papers appearing. And the larger context that I just sketched out didn't find any resonance within teaching and research in human geography in India. Now, when I first started following these stories, the stories of these women geographers, some of uh, whom are now in their 80s, I kind of labeled this phase as a phase of missed opportunities. And I wondered why there was no questioning of uh, the invisibility of women in geography and uh, you know, no uh, networking, so to speak, as we had seen in the West. Today, wiser by a decade, I do not see it in the same um, light. I interviewed uh, many of these women who are now in their, uh, you know, as I said, in their 80s for a project funded by the University of Delhi which, and then later self-funded, which I called Voices from the Disciplinary Edge. When I um, looked at the life stories of these women, I found what was key to their engaging and pushing boundaries was their familiar uh, familial contexts where they came from um, families which were uh, educated, families where responsibility had been thrust early on these women. And so their arrival at questions um, of gender was much before their time. They managed to negotiate their careers in a male dominated field through forging fictive relationships. Um, you know, somebody would be addressed as brother, somebody as uncle within the departments. And they had the support and allyship from benevolent uh, males. And this is something that we see Natalie also pointed out. And uh, so it was not as if the men were not there to support them, but not all men were supportive. Their familial backgrounds were uh, enough to sort of override the gender disadvantage that they faced. So caste class privilege over overrode the gender disadvantage that these uh, women faced in their careers. From India, if you look in the 1990s, there was an absence of uh, syllabus addressing gender questions, though at this point, Point, if you look at the older syllabus, you see that veiled questions begin to emerge in the social geography, in economic geography and other such subfields of human geography. But there remained a preoccupation with mapping gender segregated data, which had recently become available. And the focus was on calculation of disparity indices. At this point in time, the National Association of Geographers India, NAGI, hosted its first session on gender in its annual conference, 1992. Um, and it was also at this time that the Atlas of Women and Men in India was published in 1999. I'm fortunate to have seen both developments very closely and been involved in uh, this first session on gender and geography. Let me tell you, it didn't go too well. At this time, there was still an absence of critical mass of practitioners of geography and women were still quite invisible apart from this atlas. There, there was not much work on, uh, you know, gender and geography. Meanwhile, the should women count debate, um, which was raging in the Western world, failed to make any resonance in the la larger body of Indian geographers. In the 2000s, we see a new generation which has been trained uh, sort of stepping up to positions, uh, teaching positions in different national universities, national and state level universities, central and state level universities. And we see at this time a definite widening and a cautious deepening of the field. It was at this time that a woman headed the UGC uh, Committee for Syllabus Revision. She was a population geographer, Professor Sudesh Nangya, one of my teachers, and she pushed, uh, pushed for the inclusion of a course on geography of gender in this UGC model syllabi. And immediately, universities across the country rushed to uh, you know, fill that gap and bring out a syllabus which looked at gender questions within geography. So we had uh, this mushrooming and I'm very proud to say that um, the syllabus uh, from our department, which I was instrumental in shaping, became the flagship syllabus and was replicated by, you know, different universities all over the country.
At this point, uh, it was at this point that uh, Professor Janice Monk, um, I met Professor Janice Monk and uh, we began talking and one of our projects was to expand the uh, number of people or visibilize the number of people working with gender in um, uh, geography. And I suggested to her that if we retain the focus on so-called established scholars, uh, we will always have a small number. However, let us look towards the future and include those who are doing their PhDs or, you know, um, in other fields of geography, also working with, with gender as an analytical lens. So the critical mass of practitioners went up uh, to over 80 in those days. And today, I think we have over 800 um, Maria and Nitika are managing the data. So I'm really very proud to be part of this um, growth. And, uh, you know, this is significant because it went up from less than five in the previous years once we widened the net. The first major seminar to discuss how gender and geography implicate each other was organized in our department um, with collaboration with the Australian National University. In 2010, uh, Janice Monk and several members of the IGU Commission on Gender and Geography were very generous in their support and traveled on personal funds to come and support this initiation of uh, gender and geography, you know, setting the, this milestone moment in India. The second international conference followed soon after in 2014, and I'm happy to say that the Commission for Gender and Geography has been supporting student workshops, researchers from India ever since. Yet, mainstream human geography remains largely policy-driven and quantitative. Why is this so? This is something to do with the climate of research, the landscape of research, where we seem to be writing against an ontoepistemological triad. I define this triad as consisting of three points on the apex are development goals, then you have the privileging of quantitative methods and what Doreen Massey calls the petrification of concepts where uh, concepts of space, of gender have been petrified and have not been, you know, have been kept static. So it is between these three points that relevant research, the relevance of research is framed and funding for the same is made available. Available. But as I've uh, argued before, that this, this kind of triad replicates the colonial view from nowhere. It marginalizes and makes invisible local vernacular traditional and intuitive knowledges mostly held by women and those on the margins of the project of geography. These offer no ontological depth and the focus of research simply gets reduced to uh, mapping the frequency of occurrence of distributions, concentrations, at the, at the cost of interrogating the social structures that produce these very patterns. And needless to say, gender and feminist geographies get pushed to marginal um, positions and they are, uh, you know, framed within uh, the envelope of development. So they are seen as development issues rather than societal uh, issues. And this uh, also flattens diversity diversity and um, facilitates monolithical constructs, so hides diversity, hides also dissidence in our societies. Now, some of these challenges, um, if you look at them closely, they stem from firstly a lack of vocabulary. This lack of vocabulary in the vernacular languages, where we don't have a separate word for gender, makes it easy to conflate gender with sex and see it as immutable. The other issue that one faces constantly is uh, the idea that feminism is something that is Western-centric and um, therefore, you know, at odds with our society. So Madhu Kishwar has uh, written an essay on why I'm not a feminist uh, in, uh, way back in 1991. Whereas, I, in my observation, I echo what our president um, said in her presentation, that we fail to look at the everyday feminisms that we are constantly enacting. 
The other issue with writing, with researching women's lives, and uh, you know, the, one of the constraints is that this heavy emphasis on uh, the use of quantitative methods, a positivistic uh, kind of approach, the use of the scientific um, method, all of which become part of this ontoepistemological triad. So this needs to be diluted, and we are on the job. Let me assure you. The theoretical lens through which we try to gen, uh, theorize gender in Indian context or in Southern context, if we borrow lenses from um, Europe and US, then our uh, lives, we come across as uh, people with no agency, as permanent subjects, as colluders in our own oppression. But if we borrow a theoretical uh, framework of Kandiyoti, her, you know, her definition of classic patriarchy and uh, patriarchal bargains, if you look at the work of South Joseph and some of my own work, Genderscapes and later Genderscapes of Hate, then it becomes easier to visibilize agency, to deepen this field uh, of geographies of gender towards feminist geography in our context. So some of the methodological um, lenses, some of the method methods that we have used are, um, that I have used with ease are uh, using collaborative autoethnographies or Autoethnography, especially this is especially important when uh, you know your research is not considered scientific enough or uh, valuable enough to be uh, getting funded. Um, so uh, mostly as a result of the landscape of research, the dominance, male dominance in uh, our field, we see uh, a conceptual conflation. This leads to misconnotations, mis communication and an alienation. So to give you an example, you know, um, gender violence gets uh, sort of reduced to crimes against women, which is only a small category. And vernacular gendered spaces, uh, these sort of get, you, you, don't, you don't hear about them much because they don't fit the definition of space and place. Um, you, so the vernacular gendered knowledges also similarly seem to get uh, um, you know alienated from our research some of the strategies uh, in my own theory let me try and just sort of briefly sketch it out i wrote on uh, genderscapes i proposed this theory of genderscapes where we look at we move from first case, uh, first phase, looking at terrain, looking at holding size, uh, the need for women's labor in this. And then um, I demonstrate how kinship regimes seem to correspond to this kind of map. And uh, if you map social relations within the kinship regimes, you look at the performance uh, portrayals of gender, you find that there are actually uh, the constructions of gender vary across the country. There are soft as well as rigid constructions of patriarchy. So uh, through a sort of uh, examination of all this, you can arrive at uh, the gender scape, which is a fluid and multi-layered imagined uh, space. I will sort of, um, I will end here. But before I end, I would say that uh, part of the problem is also a kind of self erasure. Deepa Narayan has written about it in 2018, which trains women not to exist or to habitually delete themselves. And again, uh, this finds resonance to what, and I find it so inspiring that Natalie talked about the imposter syndrome. I myself have been a victim and uh, Finding, trying to find ways to address this. So Deepa Narayan's book where uh, sort of threw light on the fact that this is how we have been habitually trained to delete ourselves. So thank you very much once again for, uh, for listening. And um, I hope I didn't speak too fast, but I'm open to any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ananta, for your insights on women geographers and women in geography with your perspectives from Global South while tracing the milestones from India. We now come to the end of today's presentations. I thank all our esteemed speakers for sharing their knowledge with us. We now begin the question and answer session. I now invite Dr. Maria to moderate this discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nitika. Um, to echo what Professor Catherine mentioned in the beginning of the seminar, we just listened to five women across three continents. And this speaks to the nature of feminist spaces, which are collaborative, which are careful, and which are inclusive in nature. Um, and this is how women geography.
of us come together to talk about their experiences, to talk about their pathways, and to talk about their perspectives. And if I may add, to create more space. So we'll quickly come to the question since we're running out of time. Um, we have a question addressed to Professor Natalie. Um, I can read it out from the chat, if that's okay, or would you like me to read it from the chat? I I I I read it, but uh, okay. I I think that uh, perhaps it's better to just uh, tell. I I don't know if everyone can read it on the on the chat. Yes, everyone. Yes. Can. Okay, okay. I, it it will be very very short because it's uh, really on the just on the friends friends uh, state. And um, I agree that, uh, uh, that uh, sorry, Colette, that uh, it's for all, uh, all people that uh, we have. And it, it, in fact, it's for all committees, it's for uh, all uh, councils that uh, we have at least 40% uh, of each six means. But we know that, uh, firstly, it's to increase the number of uh, female uh, uh, scientific in uh, each council, and uh, yes, uh, we we have uh, men and uh, and women. But my point is that uh, um, the consequences of uh, that that uh, as there are not enough uh, women, um, mostly at full professor, and we know that uh, in France, you need to have the title of full professor to uh, take some positions. And by this way, that we are not enough, sometimes we have many, many um, proposals, and at the end, it's not possible to accept all of them. For example, I can be, I can be near five uh, PhD juries per year, plus uh, recruitment, committees and etc and finally uh, and with my specialty in my in geography of retailing in france no in my commission i'm alone i'm the alone i'm the alone full professor and for uh, each phd jury you need to have at least uh at least one full professor for the presidency and one full professor for to report on the PhD. And I can accept. <laughs> and by this way, in, uh, in, in some committees, there are no women, not only for my speciality, but for other speciality. And it's why also I point out that in some domain of research, uh, there are less women than in other. And this is also a way to ask in my part at a, a question of the shape of discipline, because with, with a feminism, um, with gender research, um, it, would, it, it was a way uh, to, to go in another um, way to think and to do geography. And uh, I... I don't have the time to use a, a, a sentence of uh, geography, of a female uh, geographer in France. She told the feminist geography or the geography of feminists is a way to be in, to have indiscipline, indiscipline. And by this way, it was a way to go through the discipline. And uh, I like this way. I'm not sure that in English, my English is not uh, enough good to translate really the, the spirit of this sentence, but to go through and discipline by to go through. And um, yes, but this is the point. And uh, yes, it's not only a woman star, but also the, the consequences of this uh, law is that uh, many, many assistant, female assistant professor takes the position for uh, some uh, very, very uh, well uh, demanding uh, administrative staff, and we know that it's always by scientific uh, scientific produce that uh, your career is promoted. And by this way, when you do the uh, uh, the schedule for colleagues, when you do 
the uh, report for uh, the uh, department meeting. When you do the meeting with students, we have not the time to write articles. And more and more, the men are on scientific programs and women are on the uh, to uh, manage the uh, everyday life in the department. This is uh, this is the consequences of it. Sorry, I I want to I wanted to be uh, I don't want to be too long. Sorry. Thank you, Professor Natalie. We now come to a question uh, addressed to Professor Maria. It's on the chat box. Um, would you like me to read it, or would you go ahead and address it? I think I can uh, answer, and like this, we save some time, yeah. uh, because I've already read the question. About the, the examples, I would like just to refer a little bit, I didn't have the time before, about the methodology used by my colleagues to select those um, PhD theses I mentioned. Uh, in fact, they, had, they were um, looking at a database, a large database, a Spanish database, and then they have uh, taken all those theses where the, the concept or the word gender was either in the title, in the abstract, or as keywords. When it doesn't appear, they have also taken in account the, those with the word feminist, feminism, women, men, feminine, masculine, femininity, and masculinity. So through all those uh, keywords, they have identified those theses that consider gender as a category of analysis. And going to the examples, uh, in fact, at the end of their uh, article, there is a, a list. I think the best thing I can do to save time is to post the reference, although it's in Spain, at the, at the end of the reference, you have the list, the whole list, and it's very varied, I can tell you. I can just mention maybe the first one at the 90. It was invisible work and feminine contribution to agricultural enterprises, for example. And the last one from 2021, it's the caring city, urban quality of life from a feminist perspective. That could be a couple of good examples, I think. And then, Maria, I think I have a second question. Maybe yes. I go ahead with the second yes, one. Do. Yes, please go uh, It was about the sub-disciplines. Here is easy to answer because, yes, in fact, the vast majority of those uh, words are on human geography, although we can also identify some on the um, environment, uh, on environmental issues, which sometimes can be also uh, in between of human uh, geography and physical geography. And then also those on urbanism, which is uh, something which is also addressed by architectures, uh, architectural uh, studies, uh, and can be um, part of a technical approach, which is not uh, only from human geography, but also from, from other disciplines. But yes, human geography is the vast majority of the, the examples we have. Thank you very much, Maria. Thank you, Professor Maria. Uh, we have a Two questions addressed to Professor Anandita as well. Um, I can read them, so I'll just come straight to the point. I think both the questions are from uh, Bikki. So uh, the first question is, uh, how did feminism and geography help to shape uh, the discipline? I think feminism definitely, feminism in geography definitely broadened the scope of geography. And as I said, with its attention to difference, diversity, identity, location, uh, asymmetries of power, it made for far more inclusive geographies. It opened up the field of methods as well because it allowed us to, you know, um, experiment, experiment and incorporate more methods. So there, there's a lot there. There's a lot of literature already there. Uh, you could look at the Dictionary of Human Geography. There's an entire entry there. There's several literature. I'm happy to alien. But in a short one-liner, it definitely made the field broader and more inclusive. Second question, can a man be a feminist geographer? But of course, I wonder what's stopping them. Please do join us as feminist geographers. But to do that, you would need to be attentive to your male privilege. You would also need to be um, 
to constantly interrogate the differences and the asymmetries in power, uh, asymmetries in the distribution of power, societal power, and work towards diffusing, dismantling these rather than uh, maintaining the status quo. And this is important not only in your writing, but in your praxis as personal praxis. So um, please, uh, Dr. Kundu, please do join us in this project of um, becoming feminist geographer. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Uh, yes, there's one more. Uh, should I read it out for you? Uh, for me? Yes, for you. OK. Uh, please read it out. I can't see this last one. Sure, it says. Okay, were you all, oh, is it this one about the glass yes. ceiling? Okay, yes. so my project concerned women in geography. I was not looking at women all over India, and I was looking at only women within the discipline of geography, women geographers. And here, as I did say in my presentation, that the kind of um, advantage that they have, the familial advantage, the caste and class advantage, helped them to override the gender disadvantage. They were not from political families, but they were families uh, which were upper caste, upper class families, and uh, they came to the questions of gender much earlier. They were not part of politically powerful families. Um, I also do a lot of autoethnography, and as I said, I'm the first woman in a hundred years to be nominated for this IGU um, position, and the first Asian woman in 102 years to be elected vice president. I do not come um, from a family which is even remotely political. I come from a military background. But yes, I am upper caste. And so if that answers your question, Dr. Kundu, thank you so much. I look forward to meeting you in real life, as they say. Thank you. Any more questions? No, that is just those two for you. We're just in time. Yeah. It's we're just in time. So there are a couple of more comments and questions in the chat box. And um, probably we can ask the participants to get in touch with the speakers to their email IDs if they want to take up any queries, because it's very close to dinner time for some of us. And we've been here for two hours. So uh, I would like to thank all the esteemed speakers of today's session for addressing us and all the participants who chose to be here. Thank you for being with us. Um, with that, we come to the end of this webinar and uh, we now close this webinar. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.